Let's take a look at a couple examples from section 2.3. Uh, this first example is 38A from the exercises in 2.3. And this is an example of what's called the knights and knaves problem. So the idea of this knights and knaves, any of these knights and knaves problems, is that you're visiting some island and everyone there falls into one of two categories. You've got some knights and knights only tell the truth and you've got knaves and knaves always lie. And here's what, in this particular problem, what these two individuals that we encounter say. So A says both of us are knights, B says A is a knave, and based on that, our job is to figure out what these two individuals are. Okay, you might have one of each, they might be both knights, they might be both knaves. Now at the heart of this is this idea um, called the contradiction rule. And that's what these problems are meant to give us some experience using. And we're going to begin by supposing A is a knight. Now, what we're doing is we're trying to suppose something that we think is false and with the idea that that's going to lead us to a contradiction. And the contradiction rule says that if you suppose something and it leads to, to a contradiction, then what you supposed is false. So it's a way of determining that something is false, or it's a way of justifying that this statement is in fact false. Okay, so let's suppose A is a knight. Well, by definition of knight, that would mean that what A says is true. And what A said was that they're both knights. And so if they're both knights, then in particular B is a knight. And that comes from one of the rules of inference uh, discussed in this section called special specialization. Well, if B's a knight, then what B says is true. And B said that A is a knave. So now we suppose that A is a knight. That led us to A is a knave. Those two things can't both be true at the same time. So we've reached a contradiction. So the what we suppose that A is a knight um, is false by the contradiction rule. So A is not a knight. And if A is not a knight, then A is a knave. And if A is a knave, then what B says is true, because B said A is a knave. And if B said something true, then B must be a knight. So now we've identified A as a knave, B as a knight, and that concludes this problem. Before we move on to another example, let me just briefly address a question that you might have as you look at it, as you look at this. You might be saying to yourself, well, how did we know to suppose A was a knight? You know, how, how do we know what to suppose? And the answer is that we don't always know. Um, sometimes we just need to suppose something and see where it leads. In this case, we might look at the two statements and, you know, kind of see that they're inconsistent with each other. Um, and, you know, we might have a hunch that A is a knight. And we just start there and see if that leads to a contradiction. You may have to do some trial and error, especially in problems that are a little bit more complicated. Let's look at another type of exercise from 2.3, this is uh, 44. And this is kind of a, a fairly challenging one. They give us a whole bunch of statements. Okay, uh, so the instructions are a set of premises and a conclusion are given. Use the valid arguments forms listed in table 2.3.1. So that's at the end of this section. Um, those are otherwise known as rules of inference. Uh, to deduce the conclusion from the premises, give, giving a reason for each step. Okay, so I'm just going to show all of these. Um, and we see we've got several variables there. Uh, we've got the conclusion at the end. But these, the premises, A through G, 
are really given to us in a fairly arbitrary order there. There doesn't seem to be a flow from one to the next. Um, you know, in A, we've got P and Q, and then suddenly we've got R and S. Um, so it's our job to, to rearrange these and think about how we can use these with the rules of inference, um, the valid argument forms in table 2.3.1, um, to get us from those premises to the conclusion. Okay, and I'm going to show you this, and um, and th there's some other exercises in the book that you can try. So here's what I would suggest you do in in starting this: is look at those premises and see if there's any that seem to fit together or that you could piece together to use a rule of inference to reach some conclusion. And I'm going to show you an example right here. Okay. Uh, so if we took not R, if not R, then not T, and we took not S, uh, so we've got if not S, then not T, not S, um, then modus ponens, would then tell us that not T is the conclusion. So what I'm doing here, and you'll see we, we have to go through this several times in this particular problem, is when I've reached a conclusion that's not one of the original premises or not the given conclusion, I'm just going to label it. And I'm using numbers here so that we can distinguish the given A through H from the new ones that we're generating. So we've got not T. Okay, so another pair that we could uh, work with now that we have this not T is we could do W or T, not T, therefore W. That's called elimination. You might say, well, you know, how do we know to do this? And, and there isn't a one right way to do this problem. Um, there's different orders that you could go through these and there are some natural pairings that you're probably going to make in the course of this problem, but uh, that doesn't mean everyone's solution is going to look precisely the same way. But the conclusion for this whole problem is U and W. And so getting W um, is going to be helpful to advance us toward that. And also getting U by itself would help us. And that's exactly how the rest of this is going to go, is we're going to work toward getting U by itself, and then we can take W and U and combine them to, to U and W. Okay, so let's take another pair that you might have noticed looking at the original list. We've got not Q or S, not S. And so elimination again, in this case, is going to give us not Q. If P then Q, not Q, therefore not P. That's modus tollens. R or S, not S, therefore R. That's elimination. Um, again, be looking at which premises you haven't used and which might fit together, and that's kind of motivating uh, the way that this is unfolding. Not P, R, therefore not P and R. Okay, that's a sort of a building block that we see in one of the original premises. So we want to be able to use conjunction to put those two together. And once we've done that, then we can use this original premise, not P and R, if not P and R, then U, combined with this conjunction that we just made, with modus ponens to get U, 
and now we've done what uh, what I mentioned we were trying to do, which is we uh, we got w by itself. Now we have u by itself, and so we can take those and use conjunction to say u and w, which was the conclusion that was given in this problem. Okay. Challenging problem, no doubt about it, and uh, you might have to go through this a couple times and maybe try uh, some of the, the similar ones in the book. Um, there's also a couple uh, similar to this that have answers in the back of the book. Um, this is this will take a little while to to digest, perhaps, but. Um, but this is giving us practice using those rules of inference, um, which are going to be helpful to us uh, in the next couple of chapters. I hope you found that helpful. See you in the next video.